Okay, so uh, I'm sure recording. So today, uh, what we're going to talk about is just uh, we'll go through a, a, a group of uh, projects that I just picked as examples, but mainly uh, the goal for the class would be for you to essentially pick the project that you want to work on as well as teams you want to work with as well. So we'll kind of talk about that towards the end of, the, end of this uh, lecture today. So let's uh, get going through a few uh, options. And I'm, I'm particularly, uh, in, this, in this case, it's very heavy on uh, water and um, a few specific topics. But that doesn't in any mean, means that you have to pick those particular things. But let's talk about some examples so you know what to think about. Uh, because again, next week you have to pick the projects to start working on. So the, the first one uh, that I picked uh, is uh, solar water pasteurization. And what does this mean? Uh, pasteurization essentially means to take some water and make it drinkable. Uh, what does that mean? That means you kill any microbes that can uh, affect human health. Or sometimes animal health. Sometimes plant health. So there, there are different ways to think about it. But we are particularly interested in humans, of course. So, you know, why? Because one in six people on this planet do not have access to clean water, so it's a very large problem. Uh, if you think about almost all diseases, maybe 50% of these are caused by waterborne illnesses. Um, you know, it's a huge percentage of uh, deaths in children are due to contaminated water. So it's a very, very large problem. Uh, obviously, if simple solutions could be found to this, particularly those that use very little energy that can make a big impact. So that's what, what I wanted to talk about. So what can we do about it? Uh, the simplest way, to, there are many ways to, by the way, make water drinkable. As some of you probably who have to do hiking and so on know that you can add tablets or whatever. So what we are particularly interested in is uh, today is to see what you can do by heating. So to harness the energy of the sun to somehow pasteurize the water. That's a very simple way to think about it. Uh, first of all, uh, what has been found is that heating water up to 149 degrees Fahrenheit or 65 degrees centigrade pasteurizes water, killing disease causing microbes, which is an interesting point because it means that you don't need to boil the water. So you don't need to have so much energy that you actually have to boil the water. You just need enough to pasteurize the water. Now, um, so pasteurization is the use of moderate heat to kill disease microbes. Milk is pasteurized at 71 degrees Celsius, so obviously it's easier uh, than, than, than water. It's uh, 15 seconds. Or so, so uh, and, and studies show that, you know, I would say the vast majority of the bacteria water is killed, can be killed at 65 degrees in 60 seconds, so it's pretty fast. So, first of all, if you see this, what, what do you think is the problem? Let me ask. This sounds like an easy thing. That will, what, what is a, can, can in any, anyone identify a problem with this? How do you know when it's when Exactly, it's yeah. Degrees. How do you know when it is 65 degrees? You can't, yeah, because water doesn't boil, you can't tell. So the first, that's actually not an obvious, but an important problem, because you don't want to waste your fuel boiling something if you don't need, it, need to, right? So that's actually the first uh, solution that we put, one of the simplest solutions which is what basically a temperature indicator for 65 degrees. And it's not trivial, you know, people came up with it. And this is a fairly common, we'll take a quick look at it. Uh, essentially what's called a water pasteurization indicator, or WAPI. It's essentially a wax that melts at 65 degrees, so you can see you've minimized the use of it. So let's take a quick look. Uh, I gotta change this. The WAPI, or water pasteurization indicator, well, is a simple device that Sorry. indicates when water. <laughs> That's way too loud. <laughs> ah, the volume's here. Let's see. Water has been fully okay. pasteurized. That's better. A plastic vial with the wax on the top and the washer on the bottom is placed in the middle of the pack. When water is heated to the pasteurization point, the wax melts and drains to the bottom of the vial. When cooled, the wax hardens again, 
and the wafi can be turned over and reused again and again. Okay, so that's a very, very simple example of something that can make a pretty big impact, right? So, so again, I want you to, uh, not, of course, this is not necessarily have to do with optics, but I want you to think of this as an analogy. So what other technologies exist? Uh, an obvious thing is you can use a solar uh, cooker uh, with some kind of temperature indicator, as we talked about last time, or some kind of custom device, like, which does essentially like a greenhouse effect. So let's take a quick look at how that's done, because it's relevant to the way over 1 billion people are exposed to biological pathogens in the water they drink. The Aquapack uses solar energy to kill these pathogens using a proven process of deep pasteurization. Simply fill the Aquapack with up to 4 liters of water, place in direct sunlight, and observe the orange water pasteurization indicators. After a few hours, the orange color disappears, indicating that pasteurization temperature has been reached and the water is safe to drink. The Aquapack can be inexpensively manufactured in developing countries for about $2 each, providing both jobs and safe drinking water. Okay, so um, the, the two things that are important here, again, you can imagine uh, having uh, some amount of optical design that can help you improve the performance of that device, clearly, right? You can think about different ways. The second thing that you will notice here is that is that they talk about manufacturing in the local places. So that's another idea of a sustainable uh, you know, venture, let's call it sustainable entrepreneurship. But anyway, there are different ways to think about this uh, option as well. Uh, I would say the most simplest thing that you can even imagine, essentially, is to leave water for several hours in a PET bottle out in the sun. So you essentially take a plastic bottle, make a greenhouse out of it, and the temperature in the water in the in, inside the water is high enough that you get some kind of disinfection. And of course, in, there's an advantage here in the sun is that you, can, you also get UV rays, which we will talk about in this class, and they can kill bacteria much more effectively than visible you know, light. Not just temperature, you also have the UV disinfection, so you have a combined effect. You can, you can watch that video if you want to obviously time the interest of time. Okay, so that was pasteurization. Very simple idea, but certainly lots of interesting ways to potentially improve it. Uh, solar water desal desalination is, of course, another extremely important uh, problem, uh, particularly we know in Utah. It's a, we're in a very dry state. Obviously, water uh, is scarce. Uh, it will become more and more scarce as, as the climate changes as well. But what's interesting, if you look at the map of uh, water scarcity and, and, and solar source abundance, they coincide. So in other words, the regions that have a lot of insulation from sunlight, uh, power from sunlight, is basically the place, mostly the places where worse is pretty scarce. So I mean, there's obviously something we can do to take advantage of that. That's what I'm also interested in. So there are many ways this can happen. Let's start by what happens in nature, which all of you know, the hydrologic cycle, natural hydrologic cycle is essentially a natural solar desalination. Right, water from the from the oceans, which is uh, uh, of course extremely crystalline, is evaporated by the sun, and it forms clouds, and when this evaporates, of course, the salt is left behind, and you essentially have desalinated the water, and the rain falls, you get fresh water, and the cycle repeats. So, of course, you can mimic this, and this is what I would say a lot of the technologies actually do. So. Um, oh, this is somewhat different technologies, uh, osmosis. Uh, we have seen again in high school physics that if you concentrate <coughs> on just this part, uh, there's something called osmotic flow. So if you place a salt solution shown in blue here, dark blue, next to a pure water, uh, separated by a membrane which allows the water molecules to pass but not the salt molecules, if you don't do anything to it, just let it go, osmosis happens. So if you let it go and I've come back after a few hours, essentially both will become halfway salty, right in between. In other words, the water molecules will flow this way, uh, salt is not allowed to flow this way, and the pressure essentially, uh, what's called osmotic pressure, essentially equalizes on both sides. Okay. Now, for uh, desalination, of course, you want to do the opposite. You want to do reverse osmosis, which means that you want to put some energy here, pushing the water out through the membrane, 
so that the, only the water molecules are allowed to pass through the membrane, salt is prevented from passing through, and you essentially get pure water. Now, the obvious thing pro as a problem that you can think of is that it requires a lot of energy, right? First of all, it, it of course requires energy because I need to push the water through. Now, if I want very pure water, that means I need to have a very small pores in my membrane there. I need to essentially prevent all the salt from passing through, which means that the pressure required for the water to pass through these small pores is much higher. When the pressure is higher, the work done that's required to push the water through is even higher. So that's the trade-off. You need a lot of energy in order to do this. Um, so of course, we are clever. We can think of using the sun to provide that energy, which is what we'll talk about at the end. So it can be uh, photovoltaics, uh, PV, or something more direct. Now, when you look at this, can you think of any other problem other than the usage of energy? Energy is, I would say, the biggest issue, the reason why it's not, why it's, it doesn't have widespread usage quite yet. Any other problems? Water waste. Sorry? Water waste. Just How? Can you explain? So, you're going you're gonna to clog up eventually on the other side. you gotta, you got to purge out. Eventually. Yeah, so, so the membranes need replacement or cleaning. Is that what you mean? That and, and also just, just the material. Uh, I mean, you, you're, you're going to see reduced flow as you, as you clog it up. So uh, you'll need more and more energy. So, so usually they'll reverse flow through an os. Uh, yeah, so to clean the yeah. membrane. Yeah. Yeah. So, okay, so there are several points that you raised. Yeah. So the, 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 the simplest one, let's start with something simplest, is the fact that the salt will start accumulating on the left hand side of the membrane. Right? Because you're pushing water, water through, so it will remain. At some point, it will start blocking the pores. Which means that you need to either take it out and clean it, okay, or replace it forever, so it's expensive. These things can be expensive. Uh, or you can buy them in large sheets, by the way, 3M sells these things, you can buy them. Uh, or, as he's saying, you can leave them in place and reverse, allow the water to flow this way, and just clean everything out and waste that water. Right. The, the trade offs there. Um, Solar desalination, by the way, where variety of uh, sources from solar, which can be PV or something else, uh, electricity, uh, electricity from the grid, whatever, is very, very expensive energetically. So it's only done in places where uh, the cost is typically not an issue. So or in places where the, cost, the alternative costs are much higher. Examples are Israel and Saudi Arabia, um, uh, I think Spain. The largest plant in, uh, in the U.S. is actually very, is currently being built in San Diego. Um, and it's really expensive. And of course, the Southwest requires a lot of water, so that's the main reason. So one approach, as I said before, is you can use photovoltaics as a primary energy source. And the way it's done is uh, relatively simple. This is an example from a project at MIT, where all they do is essentially take a, a photovoltaics panels, pass it, uh, use that to, uh, with a tracking system, use that to um, power a, a, a de the desalination pump to push the water through. Uh, through in, in this desalination system, which is a system of membranes, essentially, with, uh, sequentially uh, purifies the water. It goes through a sequence of membranes. And then you have a tank which uh, restores them. The reason this is important, by the way, uh, people are interested in this, because it's portable. So when you have disaster relief, if you have things like what happened in Louisiana last week with, uh, with the floods, uh, the water sources is contaminated. So you know, people don't have water to drink. You have to truck in bottles of water or something. Something like this could actually be implemented on a, on a small scale or medium scale. Um, so it's, it turns out also to be an optimal control problem if you think about it, right? Uh, if you think about this, and if you want to use the sun, the sun is a variable source, right? But uh, you might know this or may not know this, but motors work most efficiently when they run at a constant speed, which is the reason why your car on a highway gives you much better mileage than on a stop and, in stop and go traffic because you stop and go the more. Okay? If you have a constant speed, it gives you the highest efficiency. And imagine the sun is going up and down. So the power going into the pump is intermittent, which is bad. The pump was not very efficient. 
So then you can think about this like an optimal control problem. What if I had a badly stored with the solar <coughs> that I could use to essentially regulate the power that goes into the pump? It feeds back uh, from the you know the amount of sunlight that I'm getting. If I knew how much was coming, so I can kind of regulate that. that that's what I mean by the control problem. And that's exactly what these guys actually did in the MIT project. And there's a little video which illustrates this. There's no audio, so I'm talking for it. So. So you can see that's a system, and this is slowly tracking the sun. It's just on the roof of one of the buildings. Uh, and this is the, the, the um, reservoir of the water. You can see it's just it's getting filled up. They put a blue color to indicate the desalination. This is not actual desalination. Uh, and this is the solar radiation as a function of time. Okay, So it shows you the very large variations. And they drain the reservoir and it's really filled up and get more water. But what's important is that even though you have these huge you know, clouds coming in and out and so on, the motor can still operate very, very efficiently, get this constant uh, uh, flow of the water getting into the reservoir. So again, an important uh, controls problem in this particular example. So one question uh, I want you to maybe spend a few minutes thinking about, what can you do from an optics point of view to make this better? So, uh, I want you guys to uh, talk to your neighbors and think a little bit, uh, brainstorm about the, I, I, I showed you a particular problem, and think about, you know, is there anything you can do um, using your basic common sense or knowledge about optics? Let's think of for a minute or so. Can you so does everyone do you understand what the problem is that uh, you have to move your to? Or, or anything else for that matter to improve the system that you can think about? So have some sort of an optical element and then for the for the efficiency of half of that car the kind of battery storage. So once you get from the solar panel and then you can store it in the battery. If you know if you have higher I mean large amount of solar energy, you can store it to the battery and then you can exaggerate it. Yeah, But if you start collecting light over a large area and you're concentrated on the sun, you need to track the sun multiple sites. That's the thing. Okay. We'll talk about this in this class. Yeah. What essentially that means is that right now the solar panel is only collecting sun from its own area. If you imagine if you could build a concentrator that's bigger than that, you could collect more light. Essentially. Any any other ideas? I think tracking is some fundamental problem which someone pointed out. So 
I mean, if you think about what is the problem, problem is a cost, right? In nine energy. Generation tracking is not cheap, solar panels are not cheap, some, you know, many other things that you have, membranes are not necessarily cheap. Are there any other interesting ideas? You don't have to, I'm just saying, I, I want you to just start thinking about these sense of certain things. Okay, let, let's um, go on to the next uh, topic. So uh, again, still in this uh, idea of um, solar desalination. So solar des desalination is obviously very important. So there are many different flavors of it. So we want to kind of at least see the, the landscape again. Um, so salinity gradient solar ponds are probably the simplest, maybe not necessarily the simplest, but one of the simpler ways to uh, not necessarily desalinate the water, but utilize the 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 fact that you have saline water relative to fresh water for energy generation in this particular case. So the way this works is uh, not too complex, it's relatively simple. Sunlight comes in, let's say you have some kind of a pond, so imagine you're out in the desert, you know, some lake or whatever, you have a pond, uh, the salty water generally tends to be in the bottom, it absorbs, it gets hot, it absorbs more sunlight because of the density of the salt molecule. Salt has a higher absorption coefficient than water, essentially. So salt absorbs sunlight, it's hot, it, it conducts its heat to the surrounding water molecules, keeps it hot. Okay. So you get hot essentially drying down there. You have a little bit of a uh, gradient layer where you go from high salt content to low salt content, and the low salt content absorbs less of the sunlight, so it's a little bit cooler. Okay, so you, essentially, if you look at this sort of a pond, you see this temperature variation hot, medium, and not so hot. Now, whenever you have this kind of a temperature variation, you can run what's called a heat engine. You can generate energy from this because you have this temperature difference. Okay, we'll also talk about this next week uh, in, in a little more detail. But essentially what it means is that if you could somehow take this hot water, hot brine, let's say, pass it through some coils, which essentially heat up an organic working liquid in a, in a container shown there, okay? And the organic working liquid has a low temperature for evaporation, low vapor pressure, which means that when it gets hot, it becomes vapor. Okay, it becomes vapor and goes through here and runs a turbine. Okay, vapor flows and runs the blades of the turbine, creates an electricity. Then it passes through and it goes to what's called a condenser. And the condenser is essentially where the cold water is flowing through some coils, so it's a little bit cooler. <coughs> And the, va uh, the organic vapor, because it has low vapor pressure, will condense and become liquid again and flow down through a pump back into this chamber. And this is a closed loop, essentially producing energy. It's what's called a heat engine, a very, very simple heat engine. Your cold area, hot area, I can generate energy using this idea of heat engine. Okay, we'll talk about this next week. So it's a very simple idea. So um, it produces what's called low-grade thermal energy, less than 100 degrees. Um, it's used for, heat, for heating. Sometimes you can use it direct by heating some electricity production, but efficiency is low, 10 to 15 percent. And I like TV, if you think about it. Uh, but direct and diffuse sunlight can be useful. We'll see this idea again and again in, in, in various con contexts. Of course, you can also do something more complicated. Uh, example, like the concentrator, like one of you mentioned. In this case, it's a what's called a parabolic trough co collector. It's a, it's a parabola, or a portion of a parabola, shown here. Sunlight comes in. Uh, we will talk about this in the imaging, uh, excuse me, geometrical architecture. If you take a parabola and if you have light coming in, you can show all the rays that come in will come to a single focus. So it's one of the ideal concentration elements, in this case, in one dimension. Okay, so this is a section, right? In other words, in the orthogonal direction, they're all the same. So only in one direction you get a focus, which means you get a line focus, not a point focus. Okay? So this two in the focus is a line, which is basically this two. There's some fluid running through it. Of course, it gets very hot. So it heat it up, it vaporizes, it flows, and can be used to run a turbine or used for heating or whatever. So that's that, that's that here. Uh, in, of course, you can use it for desalination. Uh, and so on, but you can. It's also used in big solar fields out, out, out uh, in the desert, for example. Uh, it can be used for high-grade thermal energy or electricity production or thermal distillation. For solar desalination, is basically you can think of 
a thermal distillation. So if you have something very hot, you can of course uh, conduct its heat to water, salty water, which allows it to evaporate, which would basically desalinate. So that's where the connection to desalination comes from. Uh, again, a very simpler version of this is what's called a single effect solar still, which is uh, like that pond that we saw before. So you essentially have a glass cover, some kind of reflector to increase the insulation, uh, the illumination from the sunlight. You have something at the bottom which is a black uh, uh, absorber. Uh, you have salt water come in, it gets heated up, it uh, rises and condenses on the top, so top cooler uh, glass so cover and it drains down over the condensed surface into the uh, drain at the right hand side. And you essentially have a trough which collects that. So very simple, you know, you can, you can just put it out there and it works. Uh, inexpensive, but very slow, uh, only useful for very small amounts of water. So let's do a quick uh, practice example well, well, to get some sense for scale. Uh, the energy required to evaporate one kilogram of water at 30 degrees Celsius, which is roughly, you know, a little hot, but let's say tropical hot, uh, average temperature, is about 2.4 times 10 to the 6 joules. Now, if the solar insulation is 250 watts per meter squared, which is the power per unit area from the sun coming down here onto the water, uh, how much water can be produced per unit area per unit time? So per meter squared per second. So once you get, I mean, you can discuss. Let's think about this for about a minute or so. The idea is to think about the units that's the key here. This, what this example is for. Yeah. So you can discuss if you want. So my idea here is I want you to understand what those terms mean. It's a conflict that uh, I want you to start thinking about. That. <coughs> what is insulation? What's, what's joules? What's energy? What's power? And I'm less interested in the numbers, I want to know how you think. Okay, I mean, uh, let, let's think about it. So the, the, so the question is that, okay, what's given to us is that we need 2.4 uh, million joules to evaporate one kilogram of water or create, let's say, one kilogram. So if I had 250 watts per meter squared, how much water can I get? Per meter squared per second. Now first, we need to understand what does watts per meter squared mean? Watts is power, it's rate. Okay, what's the difference between power and energy? Right, energy per time is power. Okay, energy is an absolute number. Okay, it's the amount of energy you need to run a mile. Right, if you run the mile in one minute or you run the mile in one hour, the power is different because you've expended that energy faster or slower. Okay, that's the difference between energy and power. And these things are important for us, and we need to have intuitive understanding, not, not numbers. Intuitive understanding, okay? So 250 watts per meter squared means that watts is energy per time, so it's joules per second. Right? Joules is energy divided by time is watts. Okay? So 250 joules per second per meter squared is what's coming down from the sun. 
Okay, and if I need to find the six times million joules in order to generate one kilogram of water, how much can I generate per meter squared per second? So my input is 250 per meter squared per second joules. And I need 2.6 million joules to one kilogram. So how much water? And, and I, don't, I, don't know, I don't know the answer, but tell me how you would do it. <laughs> That's what's more important. The rate, yes. So you need 2.6 million joules, you divide it by 250 joules per second of meter squared. So what's that? Let's say, let's, so in this class, by the way, every, you, should be, you should be very comfortable rounding things down. You have to make educated guesses. They're very, very important. Uh, so we'll say 2.6 is basically 2.5, okay? So what's that? 250 times 10 to the 4 uh, divided by 250, so 10, 10, uh, 10 to the 5, 4, 10,000. 10,000, uh, uh, wait, no. No, you gotta flip it. You gotta so ten thousand, one over ten thousand, ten to the minus four, so point one grams per second per meter squared. Per meter second per meter squared. It's a small, very small number. Okay. Water, by the way, is roughly the density is roughly one, right? So if you need eight, eight cups of water a day, that's maybe. A cup of water is what? Maybe uh, five grams or so? So that's a very, very small So you get a sense of scale. So the idea, so what, what I want to, to appreciate is that if you want to do something completely passive and cheap and so on, the problem is that then the scale of the area that you need to do this becomes huge. You need a football field to maybe serve a, a family in a couple of houses. That's what I want you to appreciate. Uh, by the way, is that, is that everyone should be clear about units, which everyone should have seen this before, because we are all engineers. But uh, you know, we'll, we'll use a lot of these units uh, uh, in this class. Oops. Uh, so there are some variations to this, and this particular case with a greenhouse so is actually very similar to what we saw before, except that you actually have an actual greenhouse, and the water that evaporates up condenses on the roof of the, of the greenhouse and can be used in, in the case of uh, uh, water scares breathing. So the idea, this is desi a form of desalination, obviously. Right? The, the greenhouse that also has the desalination built into it. For those of you, I mean, I assume all of you know what greenhouse is. Uh, you know, it comes, the short wavelengths of the sun comes in through the glass, but the long wavelengths, as we talked last time in the solar filter, are trapped by the, by the roof. Okay, so it gets heated up, the water evaporates, but the roof remains relatively cool because it doesn't absorb any sunlight, so the water will condense, will flow down, and it's like this. Okay. Uh, for the purposes of the class, again, you don't need to know all the details of implementation. I want you, at this point in time, I want you to appreciate what the different uh, embodiments of these technologies are. So that's what you have to do for your first assignment. Okay. For example, the, an interesting problem here is the corrosion of the collector due to contact with selling water. Now, so that's an interesting problem. Maybe there's better ways to solve it. So, in summary, there are two ways to think about solar desalination. One is a direct method, which means that you just take the sunlight and somehow heat up the water. Okay, we talked uh, to, to create distillate. You can do it concentration of the sunlight. You can do it without concentration, which is the case of scale, uh, small scale stills and ponds. And things like that. And this is the parabolic troughs, for example, or Fresnel lens, like we saw last time. You can also have the indirect approach where you use solar to essentially produce energy to do desalination, which has some advantages because uh, once you generate the power, then you can use many different techniques for desalination. It can be reverse osmosis, it can be heating, whatever. Okay, uh, and it could, uh, and from the energy point of view, it can be solar thermal or photovoltaics. The difference between solar thermal and photovoltaics, and we'll talk about this in this class, the photovoltaics obviously creates electricity. Right? You can use that into a motor. 
Solar thermal means you take the sun's heat directly and heat something up. Okay, and there are two different technologies, both are very important. Uh, you know, solar thermal, for example, if you if you go to Germany or to China, for example, solar thermal is what you would see on most uh, domestic residential roofs, not solar panels. Uh, in Germany, you see an, almost an equal amount, I would say, if you go to many other places in the world. So there are different ways to think about it. Okay, so now I want to think about the opposite problem, uh, refrigeration. Could we cool using sunlight? Now, why do we want to cool? I mean, uh, yeah, of course, there are many reasons. Uh, you can, you know, can we, we have to keep foods, medicines, cold uh, medicines, particularly in the case of disaster relief for places which do not have access to the grid. Okay, it's very important. Could we make ice? Uh, it's a very important topic, a very complex topic, and uh, let's first start by understanding how cool refrigeration works in a conventional sense. And, and this is, if you really think about it, it's exactly the same as the heat engine that I showed you before. And you'll appreciate it hopefully when you look at this. So think about this when you see this video. In the heat engine we saw before, there's a hot region, cold region. We somehow use the difference in the temperature to generate energy. Okay, in that case, we had uh, fluid that, uh, organic, if you remember, we had organic fluid that heated up, became vapor, passed through a turbine, created electricity, then went and condensed in the cold region, formed liquid again, and the cycle repeated. Okay, that's a simple heat engine. It's a very similar thing that will happen here. So keep that in mind as you, as you watch this. So it's a regular It's going down. Yeah. So now that actually, so so I assume that's relatively clear. 
right? Again, the idea is that you're essentially pumping the heat out from inside to outside. And an obvious way to apply solar here is what? Compressor. Yeah, the compressor is the one that takes energy. So you can, if you have a big solar panel, have a battery system, just like before, you can drive the compressor. This is nothing. There's no energy there. It's just a little hole that allows the liquid to adapt, uh, expand. Right? Just lower the pressure. So this is the thing that has to do the work. Okay? So, but keep that in mind. This is a heat engine. Exactly the same thing that we saw before. There's a cold. So again, just to, just to remember ourselves, there's a cold region and a hot region, and we did some, some work between them. We'll talk about this next week. Here, it's exactly the same. Inside the refrigerator is cold, outside the refrigerator is hot, and something is happening between them. So heat engine in reverse, because you're doing it work into the system, whereas previously you're extracting work out of the system. So, okay, so let's think about the obvious thing. Solar electric refrigeration is what we just talked about. You simply take a solar panel, uh, sunlight, uh, essentially it does work. So that QS is work, which is the insulation from the sun. I is the intensity of the sunlight, multiplied by the area of the panel. So this is watts per meter squared. That's meter squared. You multiply, get watts. That's power. Okay, that power is doing some work on the DC motor because the electricity passing through it. Okay, it, the DC motor essentially does the compression, does some work on the, on the, on the gas, okay? compresses the gas to make it into a liquid, and then essentially pumps it through the system. And this is the heat that's uh, absorbed QE when the evaporation happens, so that comes in from inside the refrigerator. Okay, the condenser essentially rejects the heat to the outside. So if you think about this as a closed system, the input from the sun always has to be more than the difference between the these two. Right? That is the efficiency of the system. So again, think about this as a system. We're having work into the system and work out of the system. Okay, obviously work into the system always has to be greater than the work out of the system because you didn't get a free lunch. The efficiency is at most 100%. Usually, it's much less. But we'll talk about this also next week, so don't worry too much. But okay, if you think about this, there are some uh, some, some challenges. Uh, grid connection being one, uh, battery and variable capacity compression needed, uh, which is exactly what we had before, right? We had the osmosis, we had a motor, exactly the same thing. It's a motor. You need to have variable capacity motor, which means they need storage and things like that. Efficiencies can be relatively high, about 30%, but it's expensive primarily because the panels are expensive. We need some control system for your board. So it can be done. If you're the US military, you can do this. And you do this. This is, uh, you know, some of you, maybe, I don't know if any of you are veterans, but if you've been to the forward operating base, uh, uh, you can see pictures of these sorts of systems. Basically, they are like a big uh, trailer, solar panels. There's another approach to cooling that we should also be aware of, which has not necessarily much to do with solar itself, but it uses what's called thermoelectric cooling. Okay, this is something you might have seen, and you can actually buy little coolers for your computer or for 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 your um, or in a, a desk or something like that. They're expensive, but we should be aware of it. It's called it uses what's called a Peltier Peltier uh, effect. It's called a Peltier device. It couples a PN junction. So for those, for those of you with 3200, essentially you have a few types of semiconductor, n types of semiconductor, certain types of semiconductors where this effect is very strong. Uh, an example is bismuth telluride. So in n types of bismuth telluride, p type of bismuth telluride, they're connected electrically by, by that contact there. So it forms a PN junction. You attach a DC power source like a battery, you send current through it. The holes flow in that direction, they transfer the heat from one end, so the holes absorb the heat and transfer to the other end and release it. So these are heat sinks also, these uh, yellow parts. Same thing happens with the electrons. The electrons flow opposite direction to the current. They flow in this direction from the absorbed area to the release area. Also, that's nice heat. Okay. So essentially, with this PN junction, on one side you get a cold part, on the other side you get a hot part. Okay. 
This is the reverse again of the heat engine that we talked about last time. Similar to the refrigeration. Again, um, the big advantages here are there are no moving parts, it can be very small, portable, but relatively low efficiency and expensive. So you won't really feel too much of it. But just to say, as another example of a heat engine, you, you should appreciate it. Okay, now you can, uh, what's of course more interesting is could you go directly without having to go into photovoltaics? Could you use solar thermal refrigeration? And this exists, a fairly complicated set of ways to do this. We will, we won't go into huge detail in this particular lecture, but if one of your teams actually selects this, that could be something to look into. Because it can be complicated. Well, the basic idea is that you take the heat from the sunlight as the input to the engine. Right? So to, to have the refrigeration, you need a hot part and a cold part. So you can, of course, create that hot part by directly transferring the heat from the sun to the hot, by either solar concentration or some kind of collection, something like that. Now, uh, and I won't go into the details, though there are some uh, implementations here which uses tubes of uh, fluid as exactly like the compressor. So you have the hot part, uh, which essentially, that's the uh, expansion, and then you have the compressor, compressor which actually does the work based on uh, you know, some organic fluid that runs a turbine, for example, because of the extended uh, vapor. It's very similar to the heat engine. Anyway, I think you understand. Uh, you don't need to understand the details. I didn't mean to confuse you. But understand the, the conceptual picture. Okay. The details are complicated and they're here, but we won't go into it. There are some challenges uh, to think about. Uh, of course, for this to work very efficiently, you need to collect a lot of sunlight. So the area of the collector typically has to be large. Okay? But, and, and this is because it's a very energy intensive process, but of course, when you make a collector large, you also have large surface area for radiators to conduct your uh, convective losses. So this is something very important when you have to take into account when you do these designs. Another thing to keep in mind is that the collectors in general, um, yeah, sorry, the heat engines, which we will talk about next week, works very efficiently when the hot is very hot and the cold is very cold. In other words, the difference between the hot and the cold is very high is when you get the highest efficiency. But if your hot part is very hot, like your collector, the absorber is very hot, it also has higher uh, rate of loss from radiation, which we will talk about next week as well. So you also need to balance that out. So it's another interesting loss mechanism that we need to think about when we think about uh, heat engines in this sense. Okay, uh, so I'm going to... Uh, I guess we'll end a little early today. I didn't realize this, but so I gave you, uh, and we'll, we, I want to talk about a few other things, so we're not quite there. <laughs> um, I, I gave you several examples of potential projects, and uh, just to review, uh, the next presentation is your first presentation on, on September 22nd. And what I want you to do is uh, not terribly different than what we went through today. But mostly, like I said, we need to do a literature review, both from uh, scholar literature, industrial literature, Google, whatever, and understand the pros and cons of the different technologies, and be able to identify the key cons that you want to address. Okay, that's the basic principle I want you to do. Uh, and the rest you're familiar with. Now, the last, uh, I would say, 15 minutes or so, so you might get out the 15 minutes early, I want to do uh, introductions of the students in the class, Primarily, I want to understand your background, and I want everyone to understand your background, so I have a chance to assign teams next week. Okay? But another important announcement, and I put it online as well, is that I want you to, if you have a preference for a topic that you're interested in working for, you need to send me an email by next uh, Tuesday. Because Wednesday is when I will assign the teams in, uh, on the next lecture. Is that clear? Topics and if you prefer team team members that you have worked together if you get to know them. Okay, so so who wants to? Uh, I know you, but I don't remember your name. So we'll start with you. Sure. Uh, my name is Giancarlo. Okay. I um, have a bachelor's in electrical engineering. Um, pursuing a graduate 